Ever since Donald Trump was sworn into office, the First Lady seems to have maintained a frown just as fierce as her fashion. From dodging her husband's hand to sequestering herself in her gold-encrusted New York City penthouse long after he moved to Washington, it's unclear if this first couple actually like each other at all. While she's private, dignified, and reserved, he's the kind of guy that boasts about groping women and antagonizes foreign dictators on social media. Sure, opposites attract, especially with millions of dollars on the line, but is that enough? These are Donald and Melania Trump's most cringeworthy moments. Over it, inaugural edition. Melania's support of her husband's new career path has been subject to tons of speculation. Were you involved in the decision of your husband to become president? We discuss a lot, yes, and uh, I encourage him. In the scathing White House tell-all, Fire and Fury, author Michael Wolff wrote that when Melania found out her husband won the presidency, she cried tears, and not of joy. But Stephanie Grisham, the First Lady's communications director, denied this account. She swore Melania encouraged Trump to run in the first place and says the First Lady was, quote, very happy with the election's outcome. But during the actual inauguration, Mrs. Trump looked anything but. Melania's morose expression was so obvious that the internet rushed to her aid with the hashtag Free Melania. The miserable day was later capped off with the world's most awkward dance. Stop touching me, Israel edition. Things didn't get less awkward when the first couple jetted to Israel to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as one of many stops on their first overseas trip. The incident went down as Netanyahu and his wife escorted the Trumps across the red carpet. Trump reached for Melania's hand and was denied. After the snub, Melania went to Saudi Arabia to give a misguided speech about work-life balance to Saudi women who, as a whole, weren't even legally allowed to drive at the time. Stop Touching Me, Rome Edition the First Lady snubbed Trump again when they landed in Rome. This time, she brushed her hair out of her face in lieu of presidential PDA. But a member of the president's inner circle told Vanity Fair her perceived coldness isn't a diss. Melania reportedly prefers to step back and let her husband have the spotlight. But tell that to the Save Melania hashtag. Keep it professional, Maryland edition. By the time the POTUS arrived with his wife at Joint Base Andrews in Maryland, Melania had already made it pretty clear that she's not into PDA. But it seemed the president finally got the memo because he greeted the first lady with a handshake and then awkwardly nudged her off stage. Twitter lit up, with one user claiming this incident was by far the most awkward husband-wife encounter they'd ever witnessed. Another says, Nothing says I love you, my wife, like a firm handshake and false pleasantries. And others questioned if Donald and Melania actually know each other at all. Full-on PDA, White House edition. While we're certainly not behind the closed doors of Trump and Melania's alleged separate bedrooms, it appeared that the Flotus finally gave in to her husband's hand-holding advances during the state arrival ceremony in April 2018, at least for a minute. The first couple posed with French President Emmanuel Macron and his wife Brigitte. And when Trump reached for Melania's hand, she actually took it, before quickly wriggling out of it and hanging back from the pack. Ice Queen, West Wing Edition. Some say Melania is in a cold, loveless marriage, but what if that's just her personal aesthetic? If you're going by her Christmas decorations, which Vox described as a nightmare pulled straight out of a horror movie, that might be the case. Melania's take on Christmas in the White House is a far cry from the Obama's cozy, classic holiday vibe. The final results garnered her comparisons to Narnia's White Witch and also the demon from Stranger Things. Others compared the flotus dispassionately watching the Nutcracker-inspired ballerinas to Black Swan and, of course, the ring. But hey, those decorations weren't tacky. Trouble in Paradise, Porn Star Edition after more than a decade of marriage, the Trumps' 13th wedding anniversary came and went with little fanfare. But was it because there was a stormy brewing? The Trumps reportedly intended to spend their anniversary weekend at a posh resort in the Swiss Alps that was hosting the World Economic Forum, at which the president was scheduled to speak. But those plans were made before the Wall Street Journal dropped a bombshell news report claiming Donald paid porn star Stormy Daniels $130,000 to remain quiet about an affair. They allegedly had a sexual encounter in July 2006, shortly after Melania gave birth to Barron Trump. Just 11 days after the story broke, CNN confirmed that Melania had canceled her trip to Sweden due to scheduling and logistical issues, and the president attended the event alone. But two days prior to their anniversary, Melania did take the opportunity to reflect on her time as first lady. 
and you'd never know her husband had anything to do with it. She tweeted a photo of herself with her hunky military escort on Inauguration Day, writing, This has been a year filled with many wonderful moments. I've enjoyed the people I've been lucky enough to meet throughout our great country and the world. Me Time, State of the Union Edition Amidst the Stormy Daniels drama, Melania didn't limit her reported shade-throwing to Twitter posts and canceled anniversary plans. The First Lady also opted to travel solo to her husband's State of the Union address on January 30, 2018. In fact, the couple had not been publicly seen together since New Year's Eve. Though the State of the Union address is given just a few minutes away from the White House, the first couple reportedly took separate cars. According to CNN, Melania rode with some guests she invited who joined her in a special box and arrived just one minute before the president's speech was due to begin. Even more curious, Melania opted to wear a white pantsuit to the event. The year prior, Democratic congressional members donned white in protest of Trump's policies. Maybe the first lady has joined the resistance, but more likely, cream is just one of her wardrobe staples. According to press secretary Sarah Sanders, there was nothing shady about Melania's separate ride. She reportedly took her own car out of convenience. Plus, she wanted to greet guests, and the president needed to go straight inside. Trouble in Paradise, Birthday Edition Donald Trump has made a name for himself by supposedly telling it like it is, and this produced a rather cringeworthy interview when he took his executive time to call into Fox & Friends in late April 2018. The interview was shocking for a few reasons. The terrified looks from the anchors as they nervously tried to push him off air, how he may have actually incriminated himself in legal matters regarding the Russia investigation, and the way he totally admitted that he forgot to get Melania a birthday present, saying, Well, I better not get into that because I may get in trouble. Maybe I didn't get her so much. I'll tell you what, she has done. I got her a beautiful card. So what's worse, the wrath of a wife whose birthday you forgot or implicating yourself in an ongoing criminal investigation? Only one of those things can be lawyered around. Trouble in Paradise, Staff Edition Donald Trump clung to his reality TV catchphrase long after The Apprentice was canceled. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. And Trump's presidency has become notorious for its high turnover rate. As of May 2018, more than 30 staff members have reportedly been fired, forced out, quit, or retired. And it seems like critics are always speculating about who's next. But could it be Melania? According to W Magazine, the president riffed on the fact that Melania looks miserable in an overwhelming amount of public appearances, saying, I like turnover. I like chaos. It really is good. Now the question everyone keeps asking is, who is going to be the next to leave, Steve Miller or Melania? Joking about how the general public thinks your wife hates you was as awkward as expected, especially considering the notoriously private Flotus was apparently offended. Cracking a smile, funeral edition. Melania may be serious and reserved by nature, but that doesn't mean she never lets loose. Momentarily free of the president, the first lady cracked a rare smile at Barbara Bush's funeral in April 2018, and the irony wasn't lost on the internet. President Trump didn't attend the service, but Melania was there to pay her respects, sitting next to Barack and Michelle Obama. And funeral etiquette aside, Melania looked happier and more relaxed than she had in months, to the delight of the entire internet. One Twitter user quipped, Melania looks happier at a funeral than she has in ages. Even Hillary Clinton advisor Philippe Reines tweeted that the first lady allegedly always used to smile in photos, yet this was the first smile on her in years. He added, that's a woman craving distance from a monster being reminded what dignity looks like. There are a lot of aspects of Donald Trump's personal life that have made headlines during the course of his administration, but his ways of displaying affinity for eldest daughter Ivanka Trump may be the most unusual. Unlike his other children, Donald Trump has given Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner, official positions in the West Wing, which means the scrutiny surrounding their personal history is even more heightened. Not only are there several photos of them together in positions that are not typical for a father and a daughter, but Donald Trump has also publicly spoken of her in terms that many find to be totally inappropriate. Here are just some of the times Donald Trump acted inappropriately when it came to how he treated Ivanka. Hands on Dad in July 2016, Ivanka Trump introduced her father at the Republican National Convention. But while she talked about policy, what a lot of people seem to remember from her appearance is her father's reaction to her. After she finished speaking, he joined her on the stage and thanked her with a loose hug and double cheek kiss. That might have been harmless enough, but then he reached down and patted her hips and behind as an awkward send-off, which instantly set the social media world ablaze with criticism and questions about why he might feel so free to reach for that particular area of his daughter's body. Like lover, like daughter. 
There have been a lot of women whose prior personal dealings with Donald Trump have spelled out scandal since he took up residence at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But none has received quite as much media attention as the story of Stephanie Clifford, aka Stormy Daniels. Among her many explosive revelations about her relationship with Trump, she said, You, you are special. You remind me of my daughter. You know, uh, he's like, you're smart, beautiful, and a woman to be reckoned with. I like you. Soon after, Karen McDougal, a former Playboy bunny, told CNN she had a similar experience, claiming, He said I was beautiful like her, and, you know, you're a smart girl, and there wasn't a lot of comparing, but there was some, yeah. I heard a lot about her. The fact that both women came forward about stories of being compared to his daughter left a lot of people grossed out by his bizarre bedroom behavior. Shared interest? Before Donald Trump's political ambitions truly came to a head, he and Ivanka appeared on The Wendy Williams Show in 2013. One otherwise innocuous question became an excruciating case study in awkwardness. When asked what she has in common with her father, Ivanka said, Either real estate or golf. When the matter was turned to him, Donald took it to an entirely different dimension. Well, I was going to say sex, but I can't relate that. <laughs> Ivanka seemed to share the audience's bemused sense of surprise at the comment, but it wasn't the first time he went there in a TV interview with her. Career Hopes In 2006, Donald Trump appeared on The View alongside Ivanka. At the time, the two were sharing the small screen thanks to her joining The Apprentice as a guest judge, so audiences might have expected the conversation to remain centered on the subject of their reality work. However, co-host Star Jones instead opened their segment by asking the very leading question. I'm afraid to ask this question, but what would you do, Playboy put Ivanka on the cover? And not this is going to be an interesting answer. <laughs> At first, Trump's response was somewhat ordinary. It would be really disappointing. Not really. <laughs> but things started to go right off the rails when he added, I don't think Ivanka would do that inside the magazine, although she does have a very nice figure. I've said that if Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. You know? <laughs> perhaps this is the moment Joy Behar's notoriously strained relationship with the POTUS began because she retorted, Who are you, Woody <laughs> Allen? <laughs> <laughs> Locker room talk. One of Donald Trump's most frequent interview haunts throughout the years was Howard Stern's radio show. And no matter what I asked him, he would answer. In 2003, it was Trump himself who brought up the subject of his then 23-year-old daughter's looks. You know who's one of the great beauties of the world, according to everybody, and I helped create her? My daughter, Ivanka. Yeah. She's six feet tall. She's got the best body. In a later appearance in 2004, Stern pressed his luck by saying, By the way, your daughter. She's beautiful. Can I say this? A piece of it. She looks more voluptuous than yeah. ever. She's her... actually always been very voluptuous. For her part, Ivanka seems to take it all with a grain of salt. He's definitely not a typical father. He's a character. Even before she became the president's daughter, Ivanka Trump has lived her entire life in the public eye. At just nine years old, she became a target of the tabloids during her parents' infamous breakup, which played out in real time in the media and in movies. Don't get mad. Get everything. So it's no surprise that as an adult, Ivanka has maintained a tightly controlled public image of herself and her marriage to fellow real estate mogul Jared Kushner. But certain cracks in her facade, like her much-memed meeting with Justin Trudeau and the time she forgot to wear her wedding ring on The View, have led to speculation about what's really going on with her marriage to Jared Kushner. Here are some clues. Religious Rifts Jared Kushner's devout faith in Orthodox Judaism reportedly led he and Ivanka to temporarily split a few years back. The problem laid primarily with Kushner's father, Charles Kushner, who was the one who pushed for Ivanka to convert before allowing them to marry. A guest at their wedding said the elder Kushner even brought up the subject in his toast to the newlyweds at the reception, saying something along the lines of, Look, everyone thinks she's great, but being Jewish is just unbelievably important to us, and she's not Jewish. It's a problem for me, a genuine problem. Then I watched and got to see she's in love with my son, and it wasn't what I thought in the beginning. I feel right about it. How's that for botched Mazel Tov? But if Ivanka felt any kind of pressure over the conversion, she doesn't seem to anymore. She now feels that her newfound faith has blended both the modern and traditional aspects of her life as well as strengthened their family. She told Vogue, quote, I really find that with Judaism, it creates an amazing blueprint for family connectivity." End quote. She added that observing the Sabbath allows the busy parents to disconnect and unwind each week from their busy schedules. Speaking of which, crazy calendars. If you asked most married couples to compliment each other, one of the last things they would cite would be a resume item. 
but Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner aren't most couples. Prior to joining Trump's administration, they were both leaders of powerful, multi-billion dollar real estate organizations. Ivanka held a leadership role in the Trump Organization, and Jared was CEO of Kushner Companies, his family's real estate empire, as well as majority shareholder and publisher of The Observer. As you can imagine, these executive positions, while clearly rewarding, consume a lot of time and energy. Ivanka has said she works 12 to 14 hour days, and speaking to Harper's Bazaar, she boasted her pride in always arriving before everyone else at the office. That kind of drive must have been a huge turn-on for Kushner, who actually met Trump during what was supposed to be a business meeting, and that transactional nature has continued throughout their marriage. The couple's wedding program even allegedly included a marketing flyer for one of Donald Trump's golf courses, a claim which Ivanka denies. But it's kind of believable, considering how Kushner described their marriage to Vogue, saying, Quote, I would say she is definitely the CEO of our household, whereas I'm more on the board of directors. End quote. Whoa, calm down there, Casanova. Even their date nights are reportedly business-oriented as he most likes to take her to his newest property acquisitions. The Senior Citizen Squad Unlike her party girl half-sister Tiffany, Ivanka Trump has always seemed like an old soul. She told Purple Magazine, quote, Partying was never a major part of my life. I don't drink a lot. I've always preferred quiet settings like dinners." End quote. It's probably the reason Ivanka and Chelsea Clinton have gotten along so well. And our friendship uh, didn't start in politics. It certainly is not going to end because of politics. Outside of that high-profile friendship, though, Ivanka was never really one for the scene. According to Esquire, Kushner tends to surround himself with older captains of industry, which was evident at his 35th birthday celebration in which one guest described the median age of partygoers as somewhere near 70. And this probably works just fine for Ivanka, who once said, quote, Jared and I will go walk around neighborhoods and look at properties that he owns and that I own, but that's fun, end quote. So chances are you won't find these guys at your friendly neighborhood kegger anytime soon. Distancing from the dads, sorta. Though Ivanka is definitely more extroverted than her husband, neither she nor Jared come close to matching the huge personalities of their fathers. Donald Trump is obviously less poised than his daughter, and Charles Kushner, Jared's father, is also a tenacious businessman with a controversial personality. In fact, both Donald Trump and Charles Kushner have also been embroiled in their share of scandals, with Kushner actually serving two years in jail for a series of bizarre crimes including tampering with elections and arranging to blackmail his own sister. So while they both stem from outlandish dads, Ivanka and Jared are actually pretty polished, all things considered. A match made in… somewhere. For all of the speculation and media scrutiny surrounding the Trump family, Jared and Ivanka's marriage actually shows no signs of strain. Granted, they play everything extremely close to the chest, but most normal marriages would falter under the stress of just the 24-hour media coverage, let alone the privacy intrusion of a presidential election. But Jared and Ivanka's marriage is anything but normal, and the introduction of the stressful world of politics has only seemed to strengthen their bond. Ivanka told Vogue that Jared is her ideal partner because his drive and ambitions match her own, saying, quote, his own dreams are bold, and I love that in someone, end quote. Of course, that's just one way to put it. Another source close to the couple, speaking to Esquire, described them a bit more cynically, saying, quote, power, 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 power. Jared's got plenty of money, but the only way he can separate himself from his family is power. They're a great match because that's also what Ivanka is after. End quote. As they both continue to climb the ranks in the Oval Office, it's clear they've got no shortage of that these days. They grew up with two different moms, but the same billionaire father. So it's safe to say the relationship between Ivanka and Tiffany Trump, the only daughters of President Donald Trump, has been anything but conventional. Now with their dad officially in the White House, let's take a look at how Ivanka and Tiffany's bond grew over the years and how it will continue to evolve as members of the most powerful family in America. Coast to Coast Tiffany, the only child from Donald Trump's marriage to Marla Maples, grew up in Calabasas, California, about 3,000 miles away from her half-sister Ivanka's home in Manhattan's Trump Tower. Despite the distance not sharing a mother and a large age gap, Ivanka is 12 years older than Tiffany, the two reportedly remained very close. Ivanka told People magazine, we would see each other on all of the holidays and talk to each other frequently. She's my little sister. I've been close to Tiffany her whole life and I really love her. Helping Hand 
Unsurprisingly, growing up in California greatly limited Tiffany's physical access to her father and her father's fortune. As a result of the distance, Tiffany turned to her sister to ask for help getting her piece of the pie. In her book The Trump Card, Ivanka recalled a time in which Tiffany went to Ivanka for advice on how to ask their father for a credit card. Ivanka wrote that Tiffany just wanted some of the same privileges the rest of her siblings enjoyed. So Ivanka used her own influence on her father to push the request through. The art of that deal involved Ivanka convincing Donald Trump to give her a credit card with a small monthly allowance as a Christmas gift that year, and the strategy worked. It wasn't the last time Ivanka would step up to help her sister find her way into the glitzy lifestyle of her East Coast-based family. Some might assume that because of Donald Trump's major presence in New York City that he was the one who landed Tiffany an internship with Vogue magazine in 2011, but it was actually Ivanka who arranged the whole thing. Hey, what are big sisters for? Packing those bags after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in May 2016, Tiffany moved to New York City, where her bond with Ivanka grew even stronger. Ivanka said that Tiffany spent weekends with her family, often playing with her children while she lived in the Big Apple. But with Tiffany's sights currently set on law school, the sisters' close proximity to each other may not last for long. In December, it was reported that Tiffany had gone on a tour of Harvard Law School. Ivanka, meanwhile, has relocated to Washington, D.C. with her husband, Jared Kushner, who was tapped to become a senior White House advisor. During that time, though, Tiffany has taken some notes from Ivanka's style and public profile playbook, so perhaps their fashion interest will continue to bridge the physical divide. Hey, it's not like they haven't survived survived a long-distance relationship in the past. Major Assets For some, the presence of Ivanka and Tiffany in Donald Trump's presidential campaign was highly instrumental to earning him votes for the White House, particularly when it came to tempering the subject of his alleged scandals with women. Their shared time spent on the campaign trail may have also strengthened the relationship between the sisters, who appeared to be inseparable as they traveled across America on behalf of their dad. That said, the influence of the sisters was not completely equal the whole time. Ivanka is often described as playing an influential and powerful role on her father's life, so much so that some people even joked she'd be filling in as first lady in the White House. Meanwhile, Tiffany was the only adult-aged Trump kid who did not become part of Trump's transition team, and she wasn't even fully visible on the promotional front until later on in the game. Playing Favorites it's no secret that Ivanka is presented as the golden child among her siblings. Trump himself has admitted to favoring his eldest daughter in the past, and so have Ivanka's brothers. Tiffany, meanwhile, appears to be playing catch-up when it comes to her relationship with her father, after years and years of literal distance. To this day, she's often referred to as the forgotten Trump, much to her mother Marla Maple's dismay. With Ivanka at her side, though, there's a good chance Tiffany's not going to be forgotten again anytime soon. There's no question that of all the Trumps, President Donald Trump is the one who gets the most public criticism. But the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Trump's second oldest child, Ivanka, has had her fair share of controversy. Here are some of Ivanka Trump's most cringeworthy moments. In 2009, Ivanka published her first book, The Trump Card, Playing to Win in Work and Life, which is marketed as a business book for young women on how to achieve success in any field based upon what Ivanka has learned from her father and from her own experiences. But it seems like some of those young women weren't quite looking for her advice. The book received lukewarm reviews, which likely had something to do with the fact that it was full of arguably cringeworthy quotes. While some statements were simply confusing, like, success isn't something that happens to you, you happen to it. Others were criticized for being tone deaf. For example, writing about harassment, Ivanka noted that it is never acceptable, but added, at the same time, learn to figure out when a hoot or holler is indeed a form of harassment, or when it's merely a good-natured tease that you can give back in kind. She even appeared to allude to the idea of fake news long before her father ever did, writing, perception is more important than reality. If someone perceives something to be true, it is more important important than if it is in fact true. This doesn't mean you should be duplicitous or deceitful, but don't go out of your way to correct a false assumption if it plays to your advantage. 
When Red Book published Ivanka Trump's Guide to Looking Like a Boss in 2012, it included a number of pretty standard fashion tips, but one did stand out. Ivanka told the outlet, A timeless piece of jewelry like pearls or stud earrings has lasting value. I bought a vintage ring for $600 with my first paycheck. I plan to pass it down to my daughter. The problem is that Ivanka's first paycheck was largely made possible thanks to her family connections, connections that also gave her the privilege to blow an entire paycheck on a piece of jewelry because other bills, like rent, were being taken care of. As the New York Times asked back in 1997, when a 15-year-old Ivanka was getting her start in modeling, was her success due to, quote, her cheekbones or her name? According to the article, it seemed like the latter. For one, the agency that signed her had a long-standing relationship with her father. Also, the owner of a competing agency called Company Management told the paper, If Ivanka walked into my agency, I would not sign her as a model. I don't think she has that edge. I model because I love to model, and that's really all there is to it. Donald Trump has long been involved in beauty pageants and reality TV, and as Jezebel uncovered in 2013, he tried to merge the two in an effort to launch his daughter's own television career. According to sources who spoke with the outlet, Ivanka was gearing up to host a reality competition show called Trump Town Girls. Although the show never made it to air, Jezebel gained access to press materials and clips from the pilot episode, which was being produced for E!, and deduced that its main premise was pitting beautiful leggy contestants and Trump's beauty beauty pageants against the hardened real estate brokers of Trump International Realty. Apparently, teams of two women were tasked with competing to see who could earn the most commissions in any way possible. As the outlet noted, the clips portrayed the women as being intensely competitive and catty with one another, aware that working for Trump International means being replaced at any time with someone hotter. The show lacked the necessary star power to move forward, and soon enough, all mention of its existence was wiped from the internet before it ever saw the light of day. Donald Trump's relationship with his daughter has been heavily scrutinized over the years, as he has amassed what The Independent calls an unsettling record of comments. Although she does have a very nice figure, I've said that if Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. While it's not often that Ivanka's part in the relationship is explored, in September 2017, she became the subject of great Twitter ridicule when it was revealed that she still refers to the president as daddy. It was the president himself who, while inviting Ivanka to join him up up on stage during a speech in North Dakota, told the crowd. She's so good. She wanted to make the trip. She said, Dad, can I go with you? She actually said, Daddy, can I go with you? I like that, right? Although Ivanka brushed off the comment, video of the proclamation soon began making the rounds on Twitter as it was shared by reporter David Mack, who quipped, The replies to this tweet are why I re-downloaded Twitter. In addition to countless GIF replies showing people either shocked or throwing up, one user slammed Ivanka, saying, So the moral of this story is that Ivanka doesn't have anything to do, so she wants to take a ride on the big airplane with her daddy. When Fox News asked Ivanka in February 2019 to comment on the Green New Deal pushed by congressional Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which would, quote, guarantee a job with a family-sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations, and retirement security to all people of the United States, the POTUS's daughter had quite the reaction. She said, I don't think most Americans in their heart want to be given something. I've spent a lot of time traveling around this country over the last four years. People want to work for what they get. They want the ability to be able to secure a job. They want the ability to live in a country where there's the potential for upward mobility. I think this idea of a guaranteed minimum is not something most people want. Ivanka went on to point out that she believes the U.S. was doing better than it had in recent years. Ocasio-Cortez quickly took to Twitter to clap back, pointing out Ivanka's inadequacy to speak on behalf of the average American worker. She wrote, As a person who actually worked for tips and hourly wages in my life, instead of having to learn about it secondhand, I can tell you that most people want to be paid enough to live. A living wage isn't a gift, it's a right. Workers are often paid far less than the value they create. Here's something you might not know about Ivanka. Her sister-in-law is none other than Carly Kloss. The supermodel is married to Joshua Kushner, the brother of Ivanka's hubby, Jared Kushner. Kloss has rarely spoken publicly about their family connection. However, if you follow the president's daughter on social media, you'll know she's repeatedly gushed about being related to Kloss. The relationship appears to be painfully one-sided, according to Harper's Bazaar. In July 2018, for example, Trump gushed over Kloss's engagement announcement on Instagram, 
commenting, I feel blessed to have you as a sister, Carly, and look forward to the decades of happy memories we will create together as a family. In March 2019, she shared a video of herself watching Kloss host the season 17 premiere of Project Runway, in which she screamed with excitement. Carly, it's happening! However, Kloss has never responded to any of these signs of affection, nor does she follow Ivanka on social media, as Express noted. In fact, during an interview with British Vogue, Kloss talked about being related to the president's family, saying, It's been hard, but I choose to focus on the values that I share with my husband, and those are the same liberal values that I was raised with and that have guided me throughout my life. I, I, I voted as a Democrat in 2016, and I plan to do the same in 2020. When President Trump decided not to attend the 2019 Gridiron Club dinner, which got its start in 1885 and is described by the Washington Post as an exclusive gathering of politicians and media elite, he sent his daughter on his behalf. Traditionally, the evening is kicked off by the president, who shares some light remarks, before a prominent Democrat and Republican do the same, all leading up to a number of comedic sketches performed by top journalists. Clearly doing her best to stick to tradition, Ivanka tried to show off her sense of humor at the top of the evening, but according to the Washington Post, she bombed in front of 700 guests. Revealing that she had been asked to attend the dinner that same afternoon, she quipped, The press seems to think it's ironic that I, born of great privilege, think people want to work for what they are given, as if being Donald Trump's daughter isn't the hardest job in the world. In May 2018, President Trump and his administration made headlines when they introduced a new policy that called for the separation of families who crossed the U.S.-Mexican border illegally. Initially, Ivanka spoke out against family separation, but when Face the Nation asked her about the subject in December 2019, she tried to wash her hands of the issue. Host Margaret Brennan told her, We went and looked, and Homeland Security says there's still around 900 children who remain separated from their families. Is that something that you continue to remain engaged on? Rather than giving a definite yes or no response, Ivanka deflected responsibility, saying, Obviously, I think everyone should be engaged, and the full force of the U.S. government is committed to this effort to border security, to protecting the most vulnerable. Well, immigration is not part of my portfolio, obviously. She then switched gears and went on somewhat of a tangent, talking about human trafficking and praising her father. She added, That includes those being trafficked across our border, which this president has committed to countering and combating human trafficking in an incredibly comprehensive and aggressive way. The official White House website may have Ivanka listed as advisor to the president, but her role has been the topic of many questions and great debates since day one. And it's not just Americans who appear to be confused by her duties. When Ivanka appeared at the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan in July 2019, it was a whole slew of world leaders who publicly turned on her. In a video which was originally posted by the French presidential palace, Ivanka was shown trying to awkwardly take part in a conversation with the French president, the British Prime Minister, the Canadian Prime Minister, and the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, and being repeatedly snubbed. The awkward exchange inspired a slew of memes online. Meanwhile, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, in part, It may be shocking to some, but being someone's daughter actually isn't a career qualification. While Ivanka didn't comment on the awkwardness, she definitely must have felt it. As one body language expert summarized to Refinery29, she stood slightly outside the circle in a way that shows she felt unwelcomed. Also, the group didn't turn toward her to allow her in fully. In September 2019, Ivanka flew to Colombia, where she met with the country's president and vice president, inaugurated the Academy of Women Entrepreneurs, and visited a Venezuelan migrant camp. First, a slight wardrobe malfunction stole the show and made the rounds on Twitter. Then media began to turn on her, with the New Zealand Herald dubbing the trip a mission of benign diplomacy, and GQ asking, What about the immigrant detention camps here in the U.S.? Just a few months later, in February 2020, Ivanka's travels were criticized criticized again when she joined the president on a state visit to India. While Vogue asked, What exactly is Ivanka Trump doing in India? The Huffington Post didn't hold back when it proclaimed, Americans can't figure out what Ivanka Trump is doing in India, besides tagging along with dad on the taxpayer's dime. Did you know that, at 6'7", Barron Trump is 4 inches taller than his father? The teenager has done quite a lot of growing since his dad became president. How else has the youngest member of the Trump family transformed? Keep watching to find out.
Melania and Donald Trump married on January 22, 2005 in Palm Beach, Florida. While Donald already had children from his two previous marriages, the couple welcomed their first son and Melania's first child on March 20, 2006. Interestingly, Baron Trump was a U.S. citizen before his mother was, seeing as he was born in New York City. Melania, who hails from Slovenia, didn't become a citizen until July 2006, after landing a green card in 2001. Melania and Donald have always made headlines for their unique relationship. Say what you will about Donald's political views, but the couple certainly seems to take each other in stride. In 2005, Trump told Larry King on CNN that there's nothing like having children, but added, that's only the case if you have the money. Trump's perspective on daddy duties, though? I'm not going to be doing the diapers. I'm not going to be making the food. I may never even see the kids, frankly. <laughs> no, y'all. Okay? <laughs> no. She will be an unbelievable mother. I'll be a good father. What does Melania think about Donald's disinterest in being a hands-on dad? In a 2012 interview with Parenting, she said of her husband, He didn't change diapers, and I'm completely fine with that. It's very important to know the person you're with, and we know our roles. Baron Trump was baptized in the same church where his parents got married the year before. He received the sacrament on December 8, 2006 in Palm Beach, Florida, at the Episcopal Church of Bethesda by the Sea. Melania's parents and sister were present, as were Donald's children and five bodyguards, according to People. Donald himself is Presbyterian. Interestingly, Melania's religious beliefs were unknown for much of her public life. But after her visit to the Vatican in 2017, where she and Donald met with Pope Francis, the world discovered that she is Catholic. In fact, during the visit, the Pope blessed her rosary, a set of beads Catholics use to say a devotional prayer. She was dressed entirely in black and wore a black veil for the visit. While extremely private about her faith, this wasn't the first time that Melania's life was influenced by her Catholic background. Although her wedding was held in an Episcopal church, she walked down the aisle to the song Ave Maria while holding a rosary. While Barron's baptism was also in the Episcopal Church, it's unclear how much of his upbringing was shaped by either parent's religion. For Melania, though, it's evident that religion is deeply significant to her. After the papal visit, she wrote on Twitter, "'Today's visit with His Holiness Pope Francis is one I'll never forget.'" Melania Trump obviously thinks highly of Donald Trump and has made this clear throughout their relationship. At the Republican National Convention in 2016, she said of her husband, he is tough when he has to be, but he is also kind and fair and caring. This kindness is not always noted, but it is there for all to see. That is one reason I fell in love with him to begin with. When Donald was first elected president, the hashtag Free Melania went viral. But it eventually became evident that she didn't need any liberation. The two seem to understand each other, and by all accounts are much more united than people give them credit for. This admiration for Donald has melded into the love Melania has for their son, largely because Donald and Baron Trump appear to be so similar. Melania affectionately called her son a very strong-minded boy while speaking to Parenting Magazine. She also told the outlet, Baron is independent and opinionated and knows exactly what he wants. Like Melania, Baron has also always admired his dad. When he was five years old, he wanted to be like his father, Melania explained describing the close bond between the two. She shared that Baron enjoyed building things and drawing as a kid. In light of this, Baron's nickname became Little Donald, since he takes after his father so much. Baron Trump's access to the finer things goes beyond even what we might expect of a child born to a real estate mogul. Comedian Ellen DeGeneres gifted baby Baron a golden stroller. They came with a little chandelier that dangled above it, people noted. While the gift might be a bit garish, according to some folks' taste, Melania found it amusing, telling people, It's fun. It makes you laugh. Barbara Walters sent Baron a massive stuffed dog, her a later publication by People, and he was gifted with onesies sporting the catchphrase made famous by The Apprentice. You're fired. When Baron was a little older and had begun speaking, Melania and Donald appeared on CNN with Larry King, who asked if Baron had fired anyone. Melania joked, He did, yes, actually he did. He fired the housekeeper and nanny many times. Baron's living arrangements as a baby were an education in lavishness. He grew up in the Trump apartment on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and according to People, his quarters were on the floor above his parents' bedroom. This space came with a nursery, kitchen, living room, and quarters for a nanny. 
and if the Trumps were worried about baby noises waking them up, there was no need. Melania told People, Barron's a very good baby. He's not like a crybaby. He's calm, and it's fantastic. As he grew into a teenager, Barron Trump revealed a love of sports. Melania Trump confirmed this when she spoke at Liberty University in 2018, saying that Barron was all into sports. His team affiliation is notably international, as he was spotted at the White House wearing an Arsenal Football Club jersey, a soccer team hailing from Islington, London, England. He even played on teams in the D.C. area. On September 22, 2017, sports writer Pablo Iglesias Marer tweeted that Barron was on the team roster for the D.C. United Under-12 team, writing, Barron Trump is playing at RFK tomorrow. No, really. Seriously. Not kidding. In light of ongoing injury reports around the NFL, Donald Trump was asked by CBS News' Margaret Brennan whether or not he would allow Barron to play football. Trump responded, If he wanted to, yes. Would I steer him that way? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Donald went on to add that Barron's real passion is soccer. Donald also said he loves watching football but confessed that he would have a hard time letting Barron play the game because... Well, I've heard NFL players saying they wouldn't let their sons play football. So if Barron doesn't want Dad to worry, he should stick to what the rest of the world calls football. While Donald Trump's famous confession that he never changed Barron Trump's diaper when he was a baby might not compare to a lot of people's parenting experiences, Donald did stress that he liked the hands-on dad approach in other ways. Trump told People in 2006, I love to feed the baby. Not because I have to, but just because I love it. A lot of times early in the morning, I'll take care of him. Donald explains that he doesn't sleep for long anyway, so it's not a problem, adding, Over the years, I have changed a diaper, but not on Barron. Melania's response was, That's my job. While he might not be on diaper duty, it's clear that Donald loves being a father. Trump explained to People, Melania loves taking care of the baby. If we have more, it will be terrific. As Barron grew up, he became the typical shy teenager, something that came up when Donald was the president. Author Jonathan Carl described an experience in his book Betrayal, the final act of The Trump Show, where Donald spoke to reporter Zeke Miller about Carl himself. Carl quoted Donald as saying, Jonathan is very cool. He is like my son. Donald then pretended to speak with his son, saying, do you love your dad? Uh, I don't know, but he does. He's too cool. The kids. Barron Trump's relationship with his mother is vastly more documented than the one he has with Donald Trump. Melania Trump made sure that Barron learned her own mother tongue so as to connect with her and her family. Barron speaks fluent Slovenian, GQ notes, and can converse with his maternal grandparents. As Barron became more of a public figure, thanks to his father's presidency and previous celebrity, the media couldn't help but notice his connection to his mother since they were so heavily photographed. Barron is often at Melania's side during major events. Furthermore, Melania also puts Barron first, even before political protocol. The Trump family made endless headlines in 2016 for Melania's refusal to bring Barron to the White House directly after Donald's inauguration. Her delay came from a desire to allow Barron to complete the rest of his school year. Barron was only 10 at the time, and Melania wouldn't budge. Barron Trump's arrival at the White House was a novel experience in terms of presidential families. Prior presidents had children living in the White House, but the last few underage occupants were daughters. To find a previous first son who resided there as a child, one has to go all the way back to John F. Kennedy's presidency to land on John F. Kennedy Jr. While Barron certainly got a unique adolescence thanks to his dad's political aspirations, it doesn't look like it was always an easy experience being a kid in the White House. In 2017, when Kathy Griffin created an image of herself holding a severed head of Donald Trump, Barron found the visual traumatizing, and understandably so. He was only 11 at the time, and allegedly was deeply agitated by the photo. Trump shot back with a tweet, Kathy Griffin should be ashamed of herself. My children, especially my 11-year-old son Barron, are having a hard time with this. Sick. I went way too far. The image is too disturbing. I understand how it offends people. It wasn't funny. I get it. In the same year, a writer for Saturday Night Live, Katie Rich, tweeted, Barron will be this country's first homeschool shooter. This tweet was also met with outrage, both by the White House and those outside of politics. Chelsea Clinton, the daughter of Donald's political rival Hillary Clinton, jumped on Twitter to defend the president's son, writing, Barron Trump deserves the chance every child does to be a kid. So what did Barron Trump think about Donald Trump's political life? 
The young boy was frequently out of the spotlight and obviously never gave interviews. However, enough evidence came forward to show that Barron found his dad to be too hard in some moments. In Donald's debates with President Joe Biden, Barron, who was 14 at the time, felt that his father was too bombastic. According to Molly Hemingway's book, Rigged, how the media, big tech, and the Democrats seized our elections. Donald said, People thought I was too belligerent. I will say my own son Barron said, Dad, you were too tough. You didn't have to keep interrupting him. In fact, as Politico notes, Donald's children, as well as Melania Trump herself, urged him to present a more presidential persona ahead of the 2016 election so as to appear more palatable to the American voter. Trump's older children famously appeared alongside him, both on the campaign trail and in the White House. But Barron stayed out of the spotlight and away from the microphone on account of how young he was. While Donald Trump was president, he received endless vitriol, thanks to his contentious views and policies, his handling of the coronavirus pandemic, and the ways in which troubling moments in his past informed the present. Despite the outspokenness towards Donald, there was a unified attitude in the media to protect Baron Trump. After Saturday Night Live writer Katie Rich took things too far with her tweet about Baron being a homeschooled shooter, the unanimous view was to protect him and leave him alone. In an opinion piece for The Observer, Jasmine Ting wrote, He may be the son of the least popular incoming president in 40 years, but that doesn't justify personally attacking a 10-year-old boy. He he is not his father. He's a child. And until he is able to speak for himself as an independent adult, he doesn't deserve any of this. It is worth mentioning that The Observer was owned by Donald's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, at the time, so keep that in mind. However, Ting's opinion wasn't a hard pill to swallow, no matter what one's political allegiances were. On November 9, 2016, when Donald became the president-elect, media footage captured a sleepy baron as he took in the news with the rest of his family. One Twitter user wrote, I felt sorry for the lad. I really did. And if he was mine, I would have told him to go to bed or lay down anywhere. Another tweeted, quote, We are all Baron Trump, seemingly in reference to staying up so late to get the results. Part of the protection of Donald Trump's youngest son has been to keep him out of the public eye as much as possible. But Baron Trump's notable absence from major events during his father's presidency raised some questions. Barron was not with his parents when they left the White House on their last day. In addition, he was nowhere to be found when Donald issued his final address as president at Joint Base Andrews, while Trump's other children, as well as Melania Trump, were there to witness it. Meanwhile, Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner brought their children, and many of Donald's other grandchildren were present for the send-off. Although the situation sparked endless Home Alone jokes on Twitter, there might be a more serious reason for Barron's absence from these final public events. During Donald's impeachment inquiry, Professor Pamela Carlin, who teaches at Stanford University, made reference to his inappropriate uses of power and said, So while the president can name his son Baron, he can't make him a Baron. Obviously, Melania was all over this and snapped back on Twitter. A minor child deserves privacy and should be kept out of politics. Pamela Carlin, you should be ashamed of your very angry and obviously biased public pandering and using a child to do it. Others from both parties were against the comment, and it seems like a plausible connection that, following Carlin's remark, Barron was kept away from the public. Barron Trump finally got a chance to get out of the public eye in January 2021, when he moved to Florida with Donald and Melania Trump. Barron's new school, Oxbridge Academy, is near the family's Mar-a-Lago Resort and is located in Palm Beach. The school is ultra-luxurious, having been founded by business mogul William Koch and costs $34,800 annually. Fortunately for Barron, the school also offers a huge athletic program, so he's got it made in the shade. It even has a flight simulator, so he will be entertained for sure. Not only was the transition an adjustment for Barron, who went from attending school in New York City to St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Potomac, Maryland, to a new school in Florida, it also required some adaptability on the part of Oxbridge Academy. As the Palm Beach Post reports, it's the first time the school had to accommodate the Secret Service for any of its students. The head of Oxbridge Academy, Ralph Maurer, said, A small contingent of Secret Service agents will be present during each school day. We are working directly with the Secret Service to ensure that logistics and security work smoothly and discreetly with little impact on students, faculty, staff, or day-to-day -day operations. Though Barron isn't graduating until 2024, his Secret Service protection is only guaranteed to him until his 16th birthday, unless he faces threats that require their continued presence. Since the former president's son turned 16 in March of 2022, 
we expect that those days of adjustment are at an end. Height might be an odd thing to make headlines for, but Barron Trump went viral when he visited New York City in July 2021 for the simple fact that he got really tall. He's a whopping 6 foot 7 inches, according to the New York Post. He and Melania Trump were photographed leaving Trump Tower, and the comparison of Barron next to his mother, who is 5 foot 11, was striking. Donald Trump is 6 foot 3. Barron now towers over all of Donald's older children, so they can't quite call him the baby of the family anymore. The details of the sighting of Barron and Melania together were every bit as luxurious as we've come to expect from the family. Barron was carrying his mother's Louis Vuitton X Richard Prince bag, which cost an estimated $3,995, while Melania carried an $11,000 Birkin bag. The UberFacts Twitter account was all over the news and pointed out that Barron is well over a foot taller than the average 15-year-old. While some people were signing Barron up for the NBA, others followed the ongoing request to keep someone so young out of the spotlight. One Twitter user commented, Maybe don't post pictures of underage kids, no matter who their parents are. The factoid is a talking point for Trump himself, though, who mentioned Barron's height at the North Carolina GOP convention in the summer of 2021. Clearly, he's come a long way from the little boy in the golden stroller. Melania Trump was a model before she became the First Lady of the United States. With fashion choices that are different than the First Ladies who came before her, her outfits have ranged from admirably diplomatic to outright insensitive. These are some of Melania Trump's most controversial fashion moments. The media and fashion worlds waited with bated breath to see which designer would dress Melania Trump for Donald Trump's presidential inauguration in January 2017. At the same time, her rep announced in part to Women's Wear Daily, the first lady-elect will become America's new first lady wearing an American designer who transformed American fashion, Ralph Lauren. Melania Trump sported a pale blue cashmere ensemble from the American brand and she looked lovely. But Ralph Lauren's work with the first lady riled up the internet, with many social media users calling for a boycott of the label. However, Woman's Wear Daily points out that the designer has never played favorites when it comes to politics, having previously dressed Hillary Clinton, Betty Ford and Nancy Reagan in their clothes. In fact, Clinton wore Ralph Lauren at the inauguration as well. While Ralph Lauren has never made any political statements publicly, the fashion house released a statement at the time saying, The presidential inauguration is a time for the United States to look our best to the world. It was important to us to uphold and celebrate the tradition of creating iconic American style for this moment. And I know everyone's saying, oh, it's a copy of Jackie Kennedy. They both were wearing what was a modern take on a classic at the respective time. Melania wore basic classic black for her White House portrait. Her hair and makeup were styled in an equally classic look, with loose waves and more subtle smoky eye than we're used to seeing from the Flotus. However, it was her stunning beauty that gave many pause when the portrait was released in April 2017. It was her massive rock, intentional or not. The First Lady's 25 carat 10 year anniversary ring has remained one of the focal points of the piece. The noteworthy bling, which was given to her by her husband in 2014, is estimated to be worth a whopping $3 million as Glamour reports. The internet was quick to note what many interpreted as a somewhat gratuitous display of wealth. One user tweeted, and Melania's official portrait is out, all the airbrushing could almost make you ignore the $3 million ring. Another wrote, Really, you had to wear that ring, might have been a little sympathetic with America and worn a simpler piece. That's gaudy in more ways than one. Another Twitter user who wasn't too pleased with the choice asked, How many hungry people could your diamond ring feed? Just days after the Wall Street Journal reported that POTUS allegedly paid hush money to Stormy Daniels in January 2018, Melania wore a white pantsuit to the State of the Union address. The cream-colored selection paralleled the white ensembles that female Democrats wore to Donald Trump's first congressional address in 2017. Vanity Fair notes, according to CNN, they did so in the spirit of the suffragette and women's rights movements. Representative Lois Frankel stated on Twitter at the time, Tonight, Democratic members will wear suffragette white to oppose Republican attempts to roll back women's progress. However, Democratic women weren't wearing white to the 2018 State of the Union. Instead, they donned black in solidarity with the Times Up and Me Too movements, making Melania Trump's ivory really stand out in their sea of ebony.
What's more, when the Democrat woman wore white to the February 2017 congressional address, the First Lady donned a sequined black Michael Kors suit with a $10,000 price tag. Of course, no one knows what Melania's motives were for either suit. But when it comes to controversial and perhaps contrarian statements, her clothes often make it seem pretty black and white. In May 2017, Melania wore a floral coat by Italian designer Dolce & Gabbana for an appearance in Italy. The issue people had with this particular coat was that it was retailed for more than $50,000, according to the Washington Post. Of course, this didn't bother Stefano Gabbana. W Magazine reports that he bragged about the First Lady's topper option on Instagram in a series of since-deleted posts and comments. This wouldn't be the only time Melania came under fire for wearing the brand, largely due to Dolce Dolce & Gabbana's own string of controversies. Teen Vogue reports that the brand was slammed for an ad that was culturally and racially insensitive towards Chinese people in November 2018. Dolce & Gabbana also previously shamed body positivity activists, criticized parents who turned to in vitro fertilization, infamously called Selena Gomez ugly, and denounced adoption for LGBTQ couples. Essentially, money can buy designer clothes, but it doesn't necessarily give those designers nor arguably those who wear their clothes class. Melania Trump wore what was probably the cheapest thing in her entire wardrobe while visiting the children at the border detention center in June 2018. At $39 Zara jacket, which was later sold for nearly $1,000, that reads, I really don't care, do you, on the back. Whilst Flotus's rep initially told ABC News that it was just a jacket with, quote, no hidden message, a source cited by the New York Times claimed that the words on her back were actually directed at anyone, both outside and inside the White House, who wanted to criticize her decision to visit the children in light of the administration's aggressive immigration policies. During a sit-down interview with ABC News that October, Melania echoed that statement. And it was for the people and for the left-wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. While she didn't come out and say that she regretted the fashion choice, she did add that she wishes everyone would focus on her actions instead of her clothing. In August 2017, Melania joined President Donald Trump in a visit to Houston, Texas after the area was struck by Hurricane Harvey. While the former apprentice star wore khakis, a windbreaker, and what Vanity Fair described as sturdy shoes, the first lady donned a jacket, aviators, black pants, and, well, stilettos to board Air Force One. Naturally, Twitter had a lot to say at the sight of the high-heeled floaters visiting sites that had dealt with nearly 30 inches of rain. Hurricane Harvey left at least 10 people dead and destroyed countless homes, so this fashion move struck many as insensitive or, at best, tone deaf. Soon after the backlash, Melania was snapped sporting sneakers. But later that week, she was once again photographed in heels at post-hurricane sites. Manolo Blanik, who designed the stilettos, later defended Trump's footwear foible, stating to Harper's Bazaar in September 2017, I don't think she's insensitive. I think she's working non-stop to make it work. Possible she's just wearing the shoes she left New York in. Yes, I think probably she could have worn hunter boots, but she was wearing what she was wearing. In fairness, maybe the first lady thought her heels elevated her to keep her ankles dry. When most people garden, they wear old, janky clothes. They don't mind getting ripped, dirty, or otherwise destroyed in sometimes grueling, often filth-inducing process. This may or may not include Melania Trump. Perhaps learning from wearing heels to hurricane-stricken locales, the first lady sported a confusingly clean combo of Converse sneakers and jeans to harvest veggies in the White House kitchen garden at the Boys and Girls Club event in September 2017. Not so unusual, right? Except she paired all that seemingly down-to-earth gear with a plaid shirt from Bulma. The button-down top boasted a price tag of $1,380, according to Elle. In fairness to the first lady, this was a lot cheaper than her other infamous outfits and may well have been, relatively speaking, the closest thing she owned to a throwaway item. Still, as Chrissy Teigen cracked about Trump's spotless kicks on Twitter, these look exactly like my workout soles because I work out as much as this chick gardens. When Melania traveled to Africa in October 2018, her choice of accessories struck some as culturally insensitive. 
While on a Kenyan safari excursion, Floater sported a white pith helmet, which the Guardian report served as a symbol of colonization and imperialism, as they were frequently worn by European explorers and imperialists in the 1800s. Eventually, the helmets became part of the military gear, furthering the image of oppression they can evoke in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. One Twitter user wrote, that pith helmet you have carried was used by colonists during the dark days. Doesn't sit well with us Africans. Who advised you? Of course, it wasn't just the historical implications of Trump's ensemble that drew reactions. According to Vogue, the look was also compared to the garb worn by Oscar-winning goddess Meryl Streep in 1985's Out of Africa, a film in which Streep's character essentially plays a white savior in 1937. Another outfit topped with a cream fedora with black hand drew comparisons to Paul Freeman's character in 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark and Hannibal Lecter during his visit to the Bahamas in 1991's Silence of the Lambs. I want to talk about my trip uh, and not what I wear, and uh, that's very important what I do. Ahead of first couple Donald and Melania Trump's state visit to the UK in June 2019. The first lady took off in an adorable Gucci dress printed with London landmarks like Big Ben. Upon arriving across the pond, she reportedly took style clues from British royals. While out for lunch with Prince Charles and his wife Camilla, Melania wore a custom white dress and hat ensemble with a navy blue belt and trimmings. The look was noticeably reminiscent of similar outfits rocked by Prince Harry's mother and later by his wife, Meghan Markle. However, Flotus drew comparisons not just to the royals, but also to Audrey Hepburn's Eliza Doolittle character in 1964's My Fair Lady. Melania looked lovely, of course, but the outfit was, yet again, a Dolce & Gabbana number. Clearly, the first lady looking her best, but not without a fair bit of controversy is an ongoing phenomenon that probably won't end anytime soon. But perhaps Omarosa Manigault Newman put it best in her book, Unhinged and Insider's Account of the Trump White House, when she said, Taken as a whole, all of her style rebellions have served the same purpose, and not only misdirection and distraction, strategies her husband knows all too well. In December 2018, Melania Trump played tricks on the eyes of the whole world when she stepped out in nude leather leggings that, at first, and sometimes second and third glance, looked like her legs were just, well, nude. The leggings were paired with matching shoes and a green coat, making some spectators believe she was dressed like a really elegant Central Park flasher. However, if you focused on her knees, you could see the material crinkle as she moved, and there was also a visible seam going down the length of her stems. All in all, this outfit wasn't so much offensive to anyone as it was baffling, much like her decision to wear sunglasses at night. While discussing Melania's pension for headline-making fashion moments, Omarosa also wrote in her Tell All book, As a student of fashion and a keenly image-conscious woman, she knows that every one of her style choices will be scrutinized and debated. Perhaps Melania Trump could have seen the optics of this one coming. It's safe to say that Melania Trump now leads a lavish life, but was she always loaded? From her hardworking Eastern European roots to her success in the modeling world, she actually did just fine as a bachelorette. Here's how much Melania was worth before she married Donald Trump. Born Melania Kanaus in what is now Slovenia, Melania was raised under communist rule. Her father, Victor, was a salesman at a state-owned car company, while Melania's mother, Amea, developed children's clothing patterns at a factory. In GQ, Melania said of her parents, They're both hardworking. They're both very smart and very capable. They grew up in totally different environments, but they have the same values. They have the same tradition. It was clear from an early age that Melania was determined to lead a prosperous life. A former high school classmate told the New York Times, she tried to find opportunities and took them. Melania may have had a leg up. Her father was allegedly a part of the Communist Party. Being a member had benefits, and only a tiny percentage of Slovenians belonged. Although she's been brushed off as a vapid model trophy wife by the media, Melania had bigger aspirations before deciding to pout in front of the camera. Stane Yurgo, the photographer who originally spotted Melania, said she initially wasn't interested in modeling. He told GQ, school was the most important thing for her. Melania studied architecture at Ljubanja University. Professor Blas Vogelnik told the Daily Beast, I can put my hand in the fire to prove that she was a very intelligent student with a high IQ. However, Melania never graduated 
graduated and instead ditched her freshman year and exam for a modeling career. Vogelnik mused that the timeline might not have been fast enough for the budding model. She must have realized that it would take her six to seven more years of studies before she could start making good money as an architect. The average Slovenian architect makes the equivalent of $32,735 US dollars in 2020. So there's no denying that Melania's decision to leave Academy would pay off. Modeling ultimately led her to Donald Trump. Melania left Slovenia for Milan after her first year in college, and in 1996 she caught the eye of wealthy Italian businessman Paolo Zempoli, who helped her travel to America on a modeling contract and a work visa. During a 2016 campaign speech in Pennsylvania, Melania said, I loved my work, and as a young entrepreneur, I wanted to follow my dreams to a place where freedom and opportunity were in abundance. Although she never made it to the supermodel status of Naomi Campbell or Kate Moss, Melania Trump had a successful modeling career. After immigrating to America at 26 years old, Melania had to compete against younger models for lucrative contracts. Melania's former roommate, photographer Matthew Atanian, told GQ, It's not a friendly industry to models of that age. She aired frustration over the work issue. She was going to castings every day and not succeeding every day. She said things were very different in Europe, that she had been more successful. Melania began auditioning for work that her underage competitors couldn't be hired for, such as tobacco and alcohol ads. Among her first big jobs was a camel cigarette billboard in Times Square. As she gained notoriety for her relationship with Donald Trump, Melania's star and rate rose. She appeared on the covers of Vogue and Vanity Fair, among other publications. Melania also found success working with photographers such as Patrick de Marchalier, Helmut Newton, and Mario Testino. According to documents obtained by the Associated Press in 2016, Melania was paid for 10 modeling jobs in the United States, worth $20,056. And all of that work occurred in the seven weeks before she had legal permission to work in the U.S. It's an ironic find, considering her husband's immigration policies, some of which severely restrict the work opportunities of legal immigrants who attempt to pursue a career in the United States. Hollywood didn't come calling for Melania, who attempted to transition from billboards to the big screen. Her time as an actress was extremely short-lived. Thanks to her then-boyfriend Donald Trump, the future flotus nearly nabbed a spot in Sharknado 3 and made a brief cameo in Zoolander in 2001. Look, without Derek Zoolander, male modeling wouldn't be what it is today. Melania also briefly worked as a fashion correspondent for Extra. I will have the stars and the styles here at Fashion Week. Dating Donald Trump certainly came with its perks, and the story of how Melania Trump got his attention is one that she tells with pride. According to GQ, the couple met at a party thrown by Paolo Zampoli in September 1998. Although Donald arrived with someone else, he was drawn to Melania. When he asked for Melania's number, she rejected him and insisted that Donald give his number instead. Melania said, I wanted to see what kind of number he would give me. Business, home. If he would give me a business number, I'm not a girl doing business with him. But Melania got more than Donald's numbers. She also got on the A-list. The press was abuzz wondering who Donald Trump's European girlfriend was, and Melania started scoring bigger modeling deals. An infamous British GQ piece from 2000 featured Melania posing naked on Trump's customized Boeing 727, wearing handcuffs and diamonds, and holding a chrome pistol. Although Donald Trump never shouted, you're hired at Melania, a bunch of other companies did, especially after she appeared on The Apprentice. According to the New York Post, Melania was offered an endorsement deal with Levi's jeans after wearing a pair to a meeting on the television show. Melania launched a line of jewelry in 2010 through QVC and two years later founded an anti-aging skincare company. According to the Associated Press, Melania made between $15,000 and $50,000 in 2016 from these businesses. That same year, Melania filed a libel lawsuit against the Daily Mail after the newspaper published a piece claiming the future flotus previously worked as an escort. But Mrs. Trump's lawyers argue those scandalous, unproven allegations hurt future endorsement deals. In 2017, the Daily Mail paid Melania $2.9 million, adding to her net worth. After marrying Donald Trump in 2005, Melania is reportedly worth $50 million. She now ties with Jackie Kennedy as the wealthiest first lady in American history. Thankfully, Melania was successful before marrying Donald Trump because he made sure they signed a prenup. The president told Larry King that prenups are... Prenups are very tough. Darling, I love you very much. 
sign we're going to live our <laughs> right. We're going to live our lives together forever. And by the way, sign this sucker. We're not getting married. If things do in fact go sour, Melania still has a fifty million dollar net worth to fall back on, mostly acquired from her modeling days, the now discontinued QVC jewelry line, and various commercials. While nobody knows the details of the Trumps' marriage, we're guessing Melania would be just fine if she was fired out of the Apprentice alum's life. Much has been made of President Donald Trump's curiously carrot-like skin tone, which has reportedly been matched with the Pantone shade Gold Flame. Let's examine the real reason Trump's orange skin has become such a thoroughly investigated and heavily maligned topic of conversation. Is Donald Trump's skin tone the result of his friendship with self-tanning executives? Mother Jones reports that Trump is close pals with tanning mogul Steve Helbert, who became CEO of New Sunshine, a line of tanning products including lotions and bronzers endorsed by the Kardashians. Trump's friendship with Helbert reportedly began around 2006, which is close to the time the world started to notice his perpetually tawny glow. Their friendship extended to business deals. Trump promoted two of Hilbert's new Sunshine products on Celebrity Apprentice in 2011 and in 2013. Also in 2011, Melania Trump became the face of New Sunshine's caviar-based skincare line for a reported $1 million, plus unspecified perks. It takes work to get what we've come to appreciate as the POTUS's signature glow, and reports suggest that he does that work himself. Chris Blevins was a makeup artist for every presidential candidate in the 2016 New Hampshire primaries, except Donald Trump. She told Rack that she never saw Trump with a makeup artist or hairstylist. She added, Donald Trump does his own hair and makeup, maybe a little blotting powder. He's got his hair down to a science. He has a signature look he carries with him that is his look, and that's far better than changing it up all the time. In January 2018, Politico reported that Trump did have a makeup artist on the federal payroll, but that artist never spruced him up, instead focusing on members of his cabinet, including Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Kellyanne Conway. Republican National Convention makeup artist Jason Kelly told Harper's Bazaar that he believes ever since the campaign, Trump is using tanning beds and or spray tans, alleging Trump, quote, wears the goggles and you can see the hyperpigmentation around his eyes. Perhaps part of the reason why President Donald Trump's skin is orange has to do with the fact that he got sued by a makeup artist, making him reluctant to use professionals, and perhaps making them reluctant to work with him. According to the New York Daily News, makeup artist Jill Harth sued Trump in 1997, alleging that he sexually harassed her for years. Harth accused Trump of groping her, kissing her, and attempting to undress and force himself on her at his Mar-a-Lago estate in one specific 1993 incident. Trump denied all the claims and called Hart's lawsuit meritless. Many have noticed that President Trump's copper skin tone isn't evenly distributed throughout his face, pointing out that he has light circles around his eyes, a look that's been referred to as reverse raccoon eyes. Airbrush tanning expert Dante Fitzpatrick told the New York Daily News, you have to be very skilled when adding makeup on top of self-tanning. And if you do it wrong, it looks really wrong, especially in high definition. Regardless, it's possible that Trump is perfectly satisfied with his personal style. I'm a, an extraordinarily handsome person. <laughs> I have a beautiful head of hair. Perhaps Donald Trump has altered his natural skin tone because he actually has troublesome skin underneath all of that colored coating. The president's longtime physician, Dr. Harold N. Bornstein, claims Trump uses antibiotics to treat rosacea. As the New York Times reported, rosacea is a fairly common skin condition whose symptoms include redness of the skin, eye problems, large pores, broken capillaries, dry patches, and a stinging or burning sensation. If Trump's skin is red and irritated from rosacea, it's possible that cosmetics used to conceal it have the wrong undertone. It may look flawless upon application but turn orangey and unnatural as the day goes on according to Marie Claire. I know Love. all these things. I mean, I'm not a baby. I know, I all know these but things. why do you... The mystery of Donald Trump's orange skin could perhaps be solved by the most basic explanation of all, sunshine. Makeup artist Jason Kelly told Marie Claire that Trump may be absorbing UVA slash UVB rays by soaking up sun on the golf course. He said in 2017, what I'm seeing now, truthfully, is not so much tanning bed, but maybe the sun that he's getting whenever he goes golfing. And that's been pretty frequently. I think he might be getting a lot of that tan at Mar-a-Lago. Whatever the case may be, stories about Trump's skin just won't quit. In February 2019, the New York Times actually published a piece titled In the Pale of Winter, Trump's tan remains a state secret. As for his administration's response, officials have allegedly credited good genes for that year-round glow.
Donald Trump's three oldest children, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric, each hold a unique place in the dynasty built by their dad. But while they appear to be united in support of their father, their dealings between each other reveal a different family dynamic. This is the truth about Ivanka's relationship with her brothers. The first three Trump kids were all born within seven years of each other. Don Jr. in 1977, Ivanka in 81, and Eric in 84. And they grew up in Manhattan high society, raised by their parents, Donald Trump, and his first wife, Ivana. But Ivanka didn't exactly have the same interests as most uber-rich heiresses growing up. Instead, she spent her time in her dad's office, telling Marie Claire, I'd sit on the floor and hear him bid out contracts. I just liked it. I always dressed like like a girl and acted like a boy. I've never been very interested in being sort of a wild party girl and it girl. My dad is very strict. Decades later, when all three siblings were adults working at the Trump Organization, the three of them operated as a unit. Afonka wrote in her 2009 book, The Trump Card, Don, Eric, and I are always sizing up our competition on the other side of the table to determine which one of us might be best suited to a particular negotiation. My brother Don is always reminding me that you don't get what you don't ask for. But it appears that the competitive spirit isn't limited to the conference room. The challenge that I recognized early on was that we all, my father, my brothers, myself, have extremely strong personalities, we're very competitive. An often told story in Trump family folklore involves Don Jr., Ivanka, and Eric racing down the snowy slopes of Aspen. Of course, Ivanka competed against her dad, telling Marie Claire, It's in our blood. We're highly competitive. As the story goes, during one particular ski trip, a seven-year-old Ivanka was skiing down the hill when she felt something on her back. She told the outlet, I realized my dad had taken his ski pole, hooked the back of my jumpsuit, and was pulling me backward so he could basically slingshot himself over the finish line. It was all in good fun, but we're very much like that. Ivanka also looked back on the incident in a 2004 New York Magazine interview with the three oldest Trump kids, adding, We were sort of bred to be competitive. Dad encourages it. Ivanka and her younger brother Eric cultivated a special relationship that grew out of their parents' divorce. The siblings' family life blew up in 1990 when Trump's affair with Marla Maples went public. Donald eventually divorced Ivana in order to marry Marla. Donald and Marla then added another Trump kid to the family's brood, Tiffany Trump, who was born in 1993, one decade after Eric. Donald and Marla would go on to ultimately split in 1997. I'd rate myself less than a great husband. Eric admitted that his and Ivanka's bond deepened as a result of their parents' split, revealing to New York Magazine in 2004, Ivanka took me under her wing and raised me, took me shopping, tried to make me cool. Meanwhile, Eric characterized his older brother Don Jr. as helping him navigate the breakup in a different way. He said, Donnie, in a way, is like a mentor. He kept tabs on everything that my grandfather taught him over the years and that I was too young to appreciate. Two decades after their parents' divorce, Don Jr., Ivanka, and Eric had a new challenge to navigate in the public eye. Trump, who had since married his third wife, Melania, and added son Barron to the mix in 2006, spent the early 2010s building his political profile. Then, in June 2015, he announced his campaign for president with Don Jr., Ivanka, and Eric looking on from the audience at Trump Tower in New York. As the family navigated Trump's run for office, Eric frequently offered kind words about his big sister to the press. In a 2016 Fox & Friends interview, Eric responded to Republican Senator Bob Corker's claims that Ivanka would be a strong vice presidential pick, saying, She's got beautiful looks, right? She's smart. She's got my vote. I'm proud of who I am. I'm really, really happy to be a Trump. Following their father's inauguration, Eric appeared on Fox Business in April 2017 to heap further praise on his sister, adding, She's beautiful in so many ways. She's smart, she's intelligent, she's full of class, and I think that's why people love Ivanka.
Whether it was because of her position as senior advisor to the president or her status as Trump's highest profile daughter, Ivanka received particularly harsh scrutiny following her father's election win. While Eric appeared on talk shows to defend his sister's name in the wake of criticism, older brother Don Jr. struck a different tone, suggesting in an interview with The Atlantic in 2019 that while Ivanka was blessed with the ability to handle any environment, she perhaps didn't understand as well as he did how her life would change once their dad became president. As a 2017 Vanity Fair report said of Ivanka and her husband, Jared Kushner, they had become, quote, exiles on Pennsylvania Avenue. Don Jr. remembered Ivanka's life before the White House and claimed that many wealthy liberals who had previously occupied her New York social circle later turned on her. He told The Atlantic, She was loved by all the people in the world she wanted to be loved by. I just think I figured it out a little bit earlier than she did that people were going to see us differently after my father won. Eric remained at the Trump Organization when Ivanka left to join Donald Trump's White House administration, and he continued to offer public support of his sister and her work as an advisor to Donald, crediting Ivanka with changing their father's mind about a key policy decision. And I wanted to understand where I could be an asset to the administration. Speaking to The Telegraph in 2017, Eric brought up his father's decision to launch airstrikes in Syria, claiming that Ivanka may have used her point of view as a mother to sway her father into taking action against the Middle Eastern nation, which had recently launched a chemical weapons attack that killed scores of citizens, many of whom were children. Eric said, Ivanka is a mother of three kids and she has influence. I'm sure she said, listen, this is horrible stuff. For Ivanka's part, she quibbled with her brother's characterization of her sway over her father's decision, calling Eric's statement a, quote, flawed interpretation of her White House role. She told reporters via Politico, It was informed at the highest levels of military and state. I, of course, shared my perspective and opinion. It aligned with his own. His decision was incredibly well informed and advised. Throughout the Trump presidency, rumors have circulated about bad blood between Don Jr. and Ivanka. In 2017, Vanity Fair claimed that the investigations into the administration's alleged dealings with Russia had caused a division in the Trump clan, citing White House gossip that Jared Kushner, who served as a White House advisor alongside Ivanka, had possibly leaked incriminating emails from Don Jr. to the New York Times to preserve his and Ivanka's own reputation. A 2019 report in The Atlantic painted a similar picture of sibling rivalry, describing a power struggle between Ivanka and Don Jr. as a, quote, cold war, observing, they each had their own teams of allies and advisors, they had grown paranoid that the other's henchmen were planting damaging stories about them in the press. One such story was published by McClatchy in 2018 with the headline, quote, Trump kids on the campaign trail, Don Jr. wows, Ivanka disappoints. And according to a source for The Atlantic, Ivanka's camp was enraged and suspected that Don was behind the story. Later, Don confronted Ivanka, saying, "'Tell your people to stop trashing me to the media.'" Eric has continually stood by his big sister's side on several occasions when negative headlines about her have emerged. In early 2017, Ivanka was lambasted for being somehow involved in her father's alleged misconduct in a Saturday Night Live sketch. "'She's beautiful. She's powerful. She's complicit.'" <laughs> Ivanka later appeared on CBS News to defend herself, and when her brother was asked about the interview, Eric defended his sister, telling Fox Business, "'You see so many critics out there, and I think it's a sad thing. Here's somebody who took their kids out of school and moved down to Washington, D.C., is there to support our father, is taking no salary, and is an amazing talent. And she can bring so many great things to Washington, D.C.'" She can be an immense positive force um, in Washington, D.C., and um, she should be applauded for that and not criticized. When Ivanka's appearance at the 2018 Winter Olympics drew jeers from Olympic skier Gus Kenworthy and other Trump family critics, Eric appeared on Fox & Friends to strike back, offering, I think it's disgusting. That's not what the Olympics is about. Politics should not enter into the Olympics. At first glance, Ivanka and Don Jr. may appear to be on the same side of the battle between their father's administration and its critics, but media coverage of the two oldest Trump siblings' relationship has portrayed the two as bitter rivals. The media's speculation of an alleged current of bad blood between them underlines the fact that the public sees the two as their father's primary heirs, with The Guardian reporting on a 2020 survey that found Ivanka and Don Jr. leading the pack of top-minded candidates for the 2024 presidential nomination 
among Republican voters. Reportedly, Don Jr. drew roughly 29% of prospective voters, with Ivanka sitting at 16%. My father always taught me to never say never, but the last time I said no, but never say never, the headline was Ivanka wants to run for office. Whatever competition may be heating up behind the scenes, in public, the two siblings appear to be playing nice for the media. Don Jr. wished Ivanka a happy birthday in October 2019, and Ivanka shared a sweet throwback photo that December, writing, Happy birthday to the best big brother. I love you very much. Most of the world had no idea President Donald Trump had a daughter other than Ivanka until he became a presidential candidate in 2016. Tiffany, his daughter with ex-wife Marla Maples, flew under the radar for most of her life. Let's take a look inside Donald Trump's relationship with Tiffany Trump. President Donald Trump's personal assistant, Madeleine Westerhout, was fired in late August 2019 after she revealed details about his family to the press, according to CNN. And one of those details was about the POTUS allegedly body-shaming his daughter Tiffany over her weight. According to Politico, Westerhout claimed that Donald alleged that Tiffany should lose weight before she's photographed with him. Westerhout was also accused of saying the president wouldn't be able to pick Tiffany out of a lineup. While most parents would be furious with an employee who insulted their children, the president didn't sound too angry with Westerhout, despite her subsequent dismissal. He tweeted, Madeline is a very good person, and I don't think there would ever be reason to use her confidentiality agreement. She called me yesterday to apologize, had a bad night. I fully understand and forgave her. I love Tiffany, doing great. Tiffany is great. I love Tiffany. According to a source cited by People in April 2018, becoming president of the United States has reportedly brought even more distance between Donald and Tiffany. The insider claimed, Since the inauguration, Tiffany and her father have sometimes gone for months without speaking, and she went a very long time without seeing him. The last time she was at a family function with him, it was awkward for her, and she didn't feel totally welcome. The source said that they had a few moments in which they bonded during the Donald's presidential campaign, but noted that once he took office, things supposedly went by the wayside. The insider added, they always had a strained relationship her whole life, and it got exacerbated by the presidency. It's gotten much worse now. Still, a separate insider claimed that while Tiffany and Donald don't have an easy relationship, they don't necessarily have a bad one. If you ask Marla Maples, the term dad may as well be an honorary title for Donald Trump in regards to his relationship with daughter Tiffany. Though Maples acknowledged that the Donald funded their lifestyle well, Maples and Tiffany lived in California following Maples' 1999 divorce from the future president. Far from his Big Apple headquarters, Maples told People in 2016, Her daddy is a good provider with education and such, but as far as time, it was just me. Her father wasn't able to be there with day-to-day -day skills as a parent. Everything was a bit of a negotiation. I would bring her into New York a couple times a year and let her go see her dad in the office, and let her go have dinner with him and Melania. Whoops, Donald may have accidentally revealed that his daughter Tiffany was an oops baby. In 15 hours worth of audio from the Howard Stern Show released to Newsweek, The Apprentice alum reportedly recalled getting the news of Marla Maples' pregnancy with little enthusiasm. Donald said during an interview with the Shock Jock in 2004, I'm glad it happened. I have a great little daughter, Tiffany. But, you know, at the time, it was like, excuse me, what happened? And then I said, well, what are we going to do about this? Marla said, are you serious? It's the most beautiful day of our lives. I said, oh, great. Donald reportedly also revealed that he thought Maples was on birth control when they conceived Tiffany. In another Stern segment, he discussed how each time he had another kid, the inheritance for each one shrunk proportionally, quipping, well, you know, it does cut up the pie as you keep producing. When a then 15-year-old Tiffany Trump wanted an increase in her funding from her wealthy father, her beloved big sister helped out. Ivanka claimed in her book The Trump Card, Playing to Win and Work in Life, that she convinced Donald to give Tiffany her first credit card for Christmas, with a small monthly allowance on it. Ivanka wrote, if she'd been living in the same house with our father, she'd have been able to go up to him from time to time and ask for a little something extra. There were even times when he would just surprise me and my brothers with a nice gift for no reason at all, on no special occasion, and I imagine Tiffany didn't get to enjoy the same surprises, just by virtue of lack of proximity. The New York Post reported that Tiffany couldn't get a designer dress for the 2016 Republican National Convention, but was allegedly too embarrassed to borrow one from Ivanka, telling photographer Scott Nathan, I don't want her to know I don't have any money. Tiffany and Donald might not be very close in part because they didn't actually live physically close to one another for a long time. A source told People in 2018, Tiffany didn't get to be as intimately involved with the family dynamic as Ivanka, Eric, and Donnie Jr. She doesn't really talk about her dad a lot. She's always been somewhat independent of the whole family. The president himself may have inadvertently dissed Tiffany during a 2016 call to Fox News, in which he boasted about his offspring, saying, I'm very proud because Don and Eric and Ivanka and, you know, to a lesser extent because she just got out of school, out of college, but uh, Tiffany, who's also been so terrific. I mean, they work so hard. After Ivana, but before Melania, there was Marla. So why did the Donald split up with the small-town beauty queen? And did she really cheat on him? Here's why Marla Maples and Donald Trump couldn't make it last. 
Even at the peak of their relationship, Marla Maples acknowledged she and Donald Trump led different lifestyles. Maples was born in 1963 in Cahutta, Georgia, which reported a population of 700 people in 2020, the highest recorded number since the town's beginnings. In 1990, Maples told Vanity Fair, I'm like of the soil, of the country, of a solid, firm belief in God. Maples also talked to Maximum Inc. about her childhood in 2011, telling the outlet, I recall climbing trees, wading through streams, chasing cattle through the pastures, and being bucked off a few old paint horses. It was a very healthy and earthy lifestyle. Sports, family, and church were the center of my life in Georgia. Oh, I miss being out here in the country, that's for sure. The small-town beauty pageant queen was the polar opposite of Trump, a native of New York born 18 years earlier than she was. Trump's father, Fred Trump, was a businessman himself who had his own real estate empire that raked in millions for Donald and his siblings. Maples never even saw the streets of New York until she moved there in 1985. Although she had ambitious career aspirations, Maples didn't know that type of wealth. Telling Vanity Fair in 1990, I would be happier living out on a farm away from everyone and not being in this concrete world, and here he is representing everything that some people think is very materialistic. Donald Trump's first daughter, Ivanka Trump, has famously been paraded around by her father, who referred to her as his favorite in a 2004 interview with New York Magazine. After acknowledging playing favorites when it comes to daddy's little girl, Donald then remembered his second daughter, Tiffany Trump, born 12 years after Ivanka in 1993. Tiffany is the fourth child of Donald and the only child of Marla Maples. He told the magazine, you know, I have another daughter with Marla named Tiffany. She's just a beautiful, great kid also, but it's very separate. When you have separate wives, it's sort of separate. Donald revealed his true feelings about Maple's pregnancy while chatting with Howard Stern in 2004, telling the shock jock, Honestly, I'm glad it happened. I have a great little daughter, Tiffany. But you know, at the time, it was like, excuse me, what happened? And then I said, well, what are we going to do about this? She said, are you serious? It's the most beautiful day of our lives. I said, oh, great. In the midst of running multiple casinos, hotels, and housing developments, it's no surprise that Donald Trump might have been a little too tied up to spend much time with daughter Tiffany Trump. When Tiffany was born, Donald's focus was on taking his casinos public to make enough money to pay down some debts. Marla Maples opened up to Us Weekly in 2016 on what it was like raising their daughter, telling the magazine. The challenge was being able to balance being a working mom and being there for a child full time. Her daddy loves her, of course, but I was the parent. I was the parent that was there in the flesh and with her all the time." Marla added that those years were amazing and brought her the greatest joy. Even prior to their divorce being finalized, Donald published a book that addressed his views on love and marriage. He wrote in Trump, The Art of the Comeback, Marla was content when it was just her, Tiffany, and me. I, on the other hand, realized that business needed to be taken care of constantly. Maples retreated to California following their divorce and avoided the spotlight in an attempt to give Tiffany an upbringing similar to her own. In the couple's prenuptial agreement, Donald Trump presented himself as the pinnacle of wealth, worth $1.17 billion. Despite that figure, Trump didn't agree to what Marla Maples initially asked for in the event of divorce. Maples reportedly sought $25 million from Trump in a prenup, but settled for $1 million if they separated within five years, plus another $1 million to put toward a home for her. In March 1994, just a few months after they were married, Maples told Vanity Fair, we basically came to an agreement that for the first few years we would agree on something and then tear it up. So that way I feel that we have what he needs right now for his business, and then in five years I have what I need for a true marriage. Although Maples reportedly wasn't a fan of prenuptial agreements and held off on signing one for some time, her desire to get married trumped her hesitation. Both parties agreed to renegotiate the document after five years. One expert told Vanity Fair in 1994 that Maples probably didn't understand what she was getting herself into, saying, "...she thinks it's wonderful because after a few years the agreement is going to expire, but let me tell you, it will either be extended after the five years or Trump is out of there." Conveniently enough for Trump, they separated after almost four years. Rumors of Marla Maples and Donald Trump dating began swirling while Donald was still married to his first wife, Ivana Trump. But during his second marriage, it was Maples making headlines after being caught with Donald's former bodyguard at the beach near Mar-a-Lago. Spencer Wagner was the bodyguard in question, and police found him with Maples on the beach at 4 in the morning on April 16, 1996. When a police officer on duty found Donald Trump's wife here under a lifeguard stand in the company of another man. 
Both Maples and Donald denied that anything happened, with Maples claiming she was just taking a bathroom break. However, Donald fired Wagner four months after the incident. Wagner's ex-wife Mary Miller alleged that Maples was no innocent bystander, telling Inside Edition in 2016. He said she would try to pull him into a bedroom in the house, and she was aggressive. She just loved to party a lot. She liked to go out down to Miami and party when she was in town. Wagner's own story flipped over the years. At first, he also denied the affair, but later said that he and Maples were kissing on that fateful night. One year later, Donald and Maples announced their divorce. Marla Maples and Donald Trump separated in May 1997 and officially divorced in June 1999. A few months after their divorce, London's Daily Telegraph published an interview with Maples, and she offered some insight into why their marriage dissolved. Not only did she say that the marriage was, in her words, built on an illusion, she also said that Trump was never the man she wanted to marry, she told the newspaper. I'm so happy to be away from Donald, and I'm just trying to move as far away as I can. I finally found the courage to walk away and stay away. After I became a mother, I was less willing to put up with his behavior." To top it off, the Daily Telegraph quoted Maple's description of her ex-husband as an obsessive person driven by his ego. A spokeswoman for Maples claimed that the interviewer took quotes out of context but didn't indicate which quotes specifically. Donald Trump appeared on The Howard Stern Show immediately post-divorce in 1999 and offered a low-key response to his feelings on Marla Maples and their settlement. Stern stirred the pot when he joked that he knew Donald would get divorced because too many women were, quote, throwing themselves at him. Trump didn't confirm nor deny that claim but coyly replied, Marla was really a good, a good person. You know, with all fairness, we had a great time. She did stick by me. You know, in the early 90s, I did have a tough time, and it wasn't the greatest time of my life." Trump seemingly backpedaled on his comments praising her when he appeared on the show again later the same year. Stern said he'd recently been looking at pictures of Maples and commented, "'She fell apart. You got rid of her just at the right time.'" Trump agreed, telling Stern, "'Just in time. Let's say that I'm very happy.'" In 2016, Marla Maples sat down with the hosts of Access Hollywood and spoke more on why her marriage failed. Maples reiterated how different she and Donald Trump were and said they simply couldn't bring out the best in each other. Maples cited her Georgia roots, family values, and spiritual growth as reasons she and the business-minded tycoon had to move on from each other. She even described things between them as a little bit combative during their relationship, explaining that she thought she could change him at the time. Girls when we're in our 20s, we want to change the men we're with. We just think, well, of that course. love is going to make them a little softer. Per the New York Times, in May 1997, Donald Trump tipped off Gene McIntosh, a former deputy editor at Page Six, that he was splitting with Maples. Trump said that Marla's family, which he called an entourage of dumb Southerners, was essentially to blame for the divorce. He told McIntosh, "'Are you old enough to remember the show The Beverly Hillbillies? That's exactly her family, except they came to New York City instead of Beverly Hills.'" There's been plenty of opportunity to reveal the nitty-gritty on what went down in their relationship, but Donald Trump's and Marla Maples' prenup and divorce settlement prohibit Maples from revealing too much information. So when rumors of a tell-all memoir from Maples came about, it seemed too good to be true in light of their ironclad confidentiality agreement. The book, titled It's About Time, reportedly never came to fruition because Maples failed to get Trump to sign off on its publication. Maples reportedly even had a publisher ready to get the book on shelves before the denial, according to Page Six. This marked the second time that Maples had tried to tell her side of the story, as another book set to publish in 2001, All That Glitters Is Not Gold, never made it to shelves after both the publisher and Maples agreed to not follow through with publication. With the possibility of any memoir leading Maples to face a lawsuit, considering the non-disclosure agreement she signed, fans can understand why she can be dodgy or vague when asked about her ex. Did you know that Melania Trump is the only first lady to have been born in a communist country? Let's take a look back to see Melania's rapid transformation from globetrotting model to first lady of the United States. Melania Kanaus was born on April 26, 1970 in Slovenia, which was located in the former communist country of Yugoslavia at the time. As was typical for families growing up in communist societies, her parents both worked for state-owned companies. Her mom worked at a textile factory and was a budding fashion designer, while her father managed car dealerships, as per Bloomberg. 
Speaking with GQ, Melania opened up about her childhood and upbringing, telling the outlet, I loved my childhood. It was a beautiful childhood. It has been said that Melania was drawn to her future husband due to similarities between the former The Apprentice judge and her father. She does not deny the comparisons. Melania told GQ, They grew up in totally different environments, but they have the same values. They have the same tradition. She went on to explain that she herself is comparable to her husband, as they share traditional values. With her cherubic appearance, Melania began modeling as a child. Her mom, to whom she bears a striking resemblance, had an eye for fashion, and it was her collection of fashion magazines that inspired Melania to pursue a modeling career, as per The New Yorker. At the age of 16, she caught the attention of photographer Stane Yerko. Yerko told Today, It was January 1987 when I went home just before the end of the fashion show. On the stairs of the festival hall, I saw a girl that immediately caught my eye. There stood a tall, slender, and attractive long-haired girl with distinct eyes. This propelled her toward modeling success as an adult, where she posed for numerous reputable fashion brands. When GQ asked Melania whether she had undergone cosmetic procedures to enhance her chances at making it as a model, she replied staunchly in the negative, explaining that she has merely been blessed with the good genes of her mother. Melania told the outlet, A lot of people say I am using all the procedures for my face. I didn't do anything. I live a healthy life. I take care of my skin and my body. I'm against Botox. I'm against injections. I think it's damaging your face, damaging your nerves. It's all me. The erstwhile Melania Knauss had been modeling when Donald Trump was drawn to her alluring looks. However, she never reached the supermodel status of, say, icons such as Naomi Campbell or Claudia Schiffer. And by the late 90s, a woman in her mid-20s was inexplicably considered too old for the catwalk. Trump and the former Miss Knauss met through Paolo Zampoli, the founder of ID Models, during a fashion week party per Harper's Bazaar. In typical Donald Trump style, he attended the event with another woman, but set his eyes on the Slovenian beauty. What's more, he was actually still married to his second wife, Marla Maples, though they had separated a year earlier per the New York Times. Melania told Harper's Bazaar, He wanted my number, but he was with a date, so of course I didn't give it to him. I said, I am not giving you my number. You give me yours, and I will call you. I wanted to see what kind of number he would give me. If it was a business number, I'm not doing business with you. However, as she soon discovered, Trump had an entirely different business model on his mind. By 1999, Melania had been on her first date with Donald Trump to an A-list nightclub, and they began a relationship. Melania chatted to ABC News about her relationship with her future husband, but she was rather reluctant to discuss whether she would marry the billionaire real estate heir, appearing somewhat uncertain as to their future. When asked whether she would sign a prenuptial agreement, she smiled and replied, You know, everybody has different opinions. So, let's see what's happened. In an eerie moment of foreshadowing, Melania was also asked about potentially becoming the first lady. I would be very traditional, like Jackie Kennedy. The question was in reference to the fact that Donald had been toying with the idea of a presidential run at the time. The couple was also interviewed by Dan Rather in 1999 regarding Trump's presidential bid. When the host quizzed Melania on her relationship with the Donald, asking what's the worst thing about him, Melania replied, I don't have the worst thing. She's doing a good job, wow. New Millennium, New Melania. The model decided to celebrate the end of Y2K with a new home. Only a few individuals are fortunate enough to be granted a so-called Einstein visa. But in 2001, Trump was awarded one to work in the U.S. Questions remain as to how a model was bestowed something usually reserved for those with extraordinary talents. Immigration lawyer David Leopold asked the Washington Post, What did she submit? There are a lot of questions about how she procured entry into the United States. However Trump may have acquired the Einstein visa, there is no doubt that she loves her newfound home. Speaking with Tatler, she argued that she is proof that the American dream really exists. 
She suggested that her Key Life events were all leading up to her role as First Lady. Melania told the outlet, Every step in my life had a different turning point. Growing up in Slovenia, living in both Milan and Paris at a young age, then moving to the United States and living in New York City in my 20s. All of that has led to my serving our great nation as First Lady. When it comes to fate, she was dealt the Trump card. By 2002, Melania Trump was appearing at ritzy galas with her billionaire boyfriend. These swanky events provided the perfect vehicle for Trump to showcase her sartorial passions. With an increasing public profile came a swag to the formerly reserved model, who now pouted at the camera as she posed with John. Melania told Harper's Bazaar, Of course I always loved fashion, and I was always the tallest one and the skinniest one, so that helped. Melania has indeed always been fashion forward and quick to embrace the latest trends. Lingerie as evening wear was all the rage in the early 2000s, so she can be seen wearing slinky silk dresses that showcased her statuesque figure during public appearances in 2002. Speaking with people, she further discussed her interest in couture, telling the mag that she inherited her passion for fashion from her mom. I always loved fashion. My mother was a fashion designer, so it was always in my blood. Also in 2002, Trump took part in an important post-9-11 photo shoot for New York Magazine, in which she posed with an actual New York firefighter, Daniel T. Keene. Keene said of the surreal experience, the person who was doing my hair and makeup, they said, do you know who that is? I don't know any models, I really wasn't into the scene. And they said, that's Melania Knauss, that's Donald Trump's girlfriend. And I said, oh, okay. 2005 was the year of the lady and the Trump. After Don finally popped the question, he made Melania his third wife. In true Trumpian style, the couple held a lavish wedding. And you better believe it was a tremendous, terrific ceremony. According to Vogue, who featured the new bride on the cover of their February 2005 issue, the lucky lady wore a resplendent Christian Dior gown embroidered with 1,500 crystal rhinestones and pearls. The wedding itself reportedly cost $1 million, though there are rumors that the true figure could far exceed that amount. Meanwhile, Melania's diamond engagement ring cost $1.5 million, according to the New York Times. However, the publication notes that the apprentice judge only paid half that amount, despite his flourishing bank balance. Trump explained, Only a fool would say, No thank you, I want to pay a million dollars more for a diamond. The star-studded guest list even included Donald Trump's future arch-nemesis Hillary Clinton, per The Hollywood Reporter. Few photos from the wedding day are public, but at the time, Melania Trump exhibited a healthy glowing tan and had dyed her hair a light honey brown, which she frequently wore in beach waves as reflective of the aughts. Despite marrying a billionaire, Trump says her life is pretty normal. Melania told Parenting, My life is very normal, for me. Maybe for some people they would not think that, but for me, it is. Prior to marrying Melania Trump, the Donald already had a large brood, but he was set on adding another Don Jr. to his name. In 2006, Melania gave birth to her first child, Baron. Donald Trump told People, Melania loves taking care of the baby. If we have more, it will be terrific. However, Baron remains the only child of the couple. Like many of the Trump kids, Baron shares an incredible likeness to his father. Melania gushed to the Palm Beach Daily News. He reminds me of Donald and a little bit of my dad. The baby looks like Donald. He has my eyes and beautiful brown hair. He has long fingers and long legs. The new mom spoke of her joy at becoming a parent for the first time, telling the newspaper, You can watch the baby, every move he makes. It's just amazing. A great, great experience. I was very lucky. I had a beautiful pregnancy. Everyone is healthy and happy. Melania Trump shares a close bond with Baron, who appeared to be a little budding savant. As Trump explained to people, she frequently communicates with her son in Slovenian. Melania said in 2009, He talks three languages. He speaks my language, Slovenian, English, and French. In 2010, Melania Trump appeared at various fashion events, showcasing her timeless and ever-evolving style. 
Notably, she appeared in a subtle black ensemble at New York Fashion Week, while her husband wore his signature oversized red tie. To mark the new decade, Trump launched a line of jewelry for QVC, which admittedly doesn't sound like a platform befitting the wife of a billionaire. When Donald Trump became president, the official White House website even mentioned Melania's jewelry line in its biography of the First Lady. The bio stated, Melania is also a successful entrepreneur. In April 2010, Melania Trump launched her own jewelry collection. As the Washington Post notes, it's highly unusual for the White House site to mention the entrepreneurial pursuits of the First Lady, so we suspect that Don may have had a hand in promoting his wife Bigley. However, QVC clarified that, while they did previously sell Melania's jewelry, QVC does not have an active relationship with the brand. No one wants to be shaded by QVC, but the television shopping network's loss is Melania's gain, as her brand continues to bring in a modest profit. According to Express, Melania's businesses made between $15,000 and $50,000 in 2016. Clearly, there is someone somewhere out there living their best life in Melania's QVC jewels. Many laughed when Donald Trump announced that he was running for the presidency in 2015. Yet in 2016, he was declared the reigning Republican nominee in the presidential election, beating the likes of arch-rival Ted Cruz. Matter of you are principle, the and I'll, single and I'll biggest tell you. liar. You probably are worse than Jeb Bush. By this point, there was an increasingly conservative shift in Melania's appearance. During campaign rallies, she sported elegant, neutral-toned attire and subtle waves, complete with soft blonde highlights. This would prove to be a difficult year for Mrs. Trump, not least because of the sexual misconduct allegations levied against her husband. In a damning turn of events, Donald Trump was caught on tape making excruciatingly crude remarks about the supposed power he wields over women. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Following through on her 1999 promise to support her husband no matter what if he were to run for office, Melania Trump fully stood by her man in the wake of the revelations. Speaking of the incident, Melania told CNN, The boys, the way they talk when they grow up and they want to sometimes show each other, oh, this and that, and talking about the girls. But yes, I was surprised, of course. Melania is nothing if not loyal, but dismissing Trump's comments as mere boy talk is arguably to the detriment of allyship to fellow women. Against all odds, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton to become president of the United States. When Don was inaugurated in 2017, Melania adhered to her 1999 promise to be like Jackie O, channeling the erstwhile Mrs. Kennedy with a Ralph Lauren duck egg blue suit and classy updo. For the first ever first lady for whom English is a second language, Harper's Bazaar argued that the choice of attire was reflective of Melania's commitment to representing and serving a nation that is not natively hers. Despite Melania being first lady, there was another woman constantly by the Donald's side. This was, of course, his daughter Ivanka, who was seemingly present at every major presidential event, despite not being Melania's daughter and regardless of the fact that she was approaching 40 at the time. Well, once a daddy's girl, always a daddy's girl. But Melania was reportedly unhappy with being overshadowed by Ivanka. In her book Melania and Me, the First Lady's pal Stephanie Winston Wolkoff claims that there was a heated rivalry between Melania and Ivanka. In an excerpt published by New York Magazine, Wolkoff writes, It was Donald's inauguration, not Ivanka's. But no one was brave enough to tell her that. Melania was not thrilled about Ivanka steering the schedule and would not allow it. Neither was she happy to hear that Ivanka insisted on walking in the Pennsylvania Avenue parade with her children. According to Wolkoff, this led Melania to launch Operation Block Ivanka. In a divergence from her usually refined wardrobe, Melania Trump wore a controversial piece of clothing in 2018. She was photographed donning a green army jacket that read, I really don't care, do you, on the back. 
Many felt this was in poor taste due to the fact that migrant children were concurrently being separated from their parents. The Guardian argued that the jacket decimated the image of Melania as a helpless victim of a powerful man, and that the brutal message revealed her true politics, writing, There was no hidden message. The message was literally spelled out in large letters. This was the moment when the world realized that Melania was not secretly signaling to be saved, but really was Donald's partner and ally. However, Trump was adamant that her jacket was not a reference to incarcerated children. Rather, she told ABC News, I wore the jacket for the left-wing media who were criticizing me, and I want to show them that I don't care. This was also the year she launched Be Best, an anti-bullying initiative. Melania said at a White House ceremony, Be Best has played a major role in spreading awareness, highlighting successful programs and acts of kindness. Some have argued that the initiative was hypocritical, considering that many of Trump's policies may be seen as antithetical to the well-being of children. During the 2020 presidential election, Melania Trump wore eye-catching ensembles, including a vibrant Gucci dress as she went to cast her ballot. In a campaign filled with invective launched against Don's competitor, Joe Biden, Melania did her best to remain stoic and graceful. But she couldn't quite escape the controversy of Green Jacket Gate, and 2020 would prove to be an even more contentious year for the usually reserved model-turned-floatus. That year, a series of tapes were sent to CNN. They were secretly recorded by Stephanie Winston Wolkoff two years earlier, and Melania can be heard expressing some questionable views. Most damning of all, she condones the incarceration of migrant children in detention centers, claiming that the conditions in which the kids are forced to sleep are of decent quality. Melania said on the tapes, the kids, they say, wow, I will have my own bed? I will sleep on the bed? I will have a cabinet for my clothes? It's so sad to hear it, but they didn't have that in their own countries. They sleep on the floor. They are taken care of nicely there. Additionally, she appears to espouse right-wing conspiracy theories that migrant children seeking a better life are coached by their parents to lie about their reasons for escaping their home countries. When Joe Biden was declared president, Melania Trump's time as first lady subsequently came to an end, but 2021 was not without controversy for Melania. Following the riot on Capitol Hill, she shared her thoughts via the White House website and didn't appear to condemn the attacks. Melania said, I find it shameful that surrounding these tragic events, there has been salacious gossip, unwarranted personal attacks, and false, misleading accusations on me from people who are looking to be relevant and have an agenda. This time is solely about healing our country. Moreover, it seems that all is not well in the Trump abode either. During an appearance with Dawn at the World Series, Melania was seen seemingly scowling at her husband while dressed in a chic tan trench coat. This wasn't the first time she she withdrew affection from her spouse. She had previously rejected his attempts to hold her hand on a number of occasions, as chronicled by Indy 100. Additionally, when Donald celebrated his 75th birthday, his wife was noticeably absent from his celebration photos, leading to speculation that she hadn't attended the bash as per People. This has led to rumors that Melania may be considering a divorce from the billionaire ex-POTUS. Ivanka and Chelsea are close in age, have young kids, and are both very tight with their parents. But despite not being quite as friendly these days, they sure have a history. Let's take a look at the current and former first daughter's real-life friendship. Affluent Start It's hard to ignore all the similarities between the two women's childhoods. Both ladies grew up with affluent means, with Chelsea growing up in the White House and Ivanka running around her dad's New York City skyscraper. But even with all the comforts in the world, the two girls grew up to be fiercely independent. The Independent Journal Review reported Chelsea turned down opportunities to attend Ivy League East Coast universities and instead jetted to Stanford. And Ivanka got down to business instead of partying like you might expect from a socialite. She studied for two years at Georgetown University, then transferred to the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Yep, girl bosses in the making. Hubby BFFs Chelsea and Ivanka met through their husbands, who also have a lot in common. Chelsea's hubs Mark Mezvinsky and Ivanka's SO Jared Kushner met and became friends while working in finance in Manhattan, according to the Sunday Express. They began taking their wives out on double dates and the two gals clicked immediately. 
According to People, Mark Mesvinsky works for a hedge fund and previously spent time as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. He's also the son of former Representative Edward Mesvinsky, who spent a few years in prison for millions of dollars worth of bank, wire, and mail fraud. Jared Kushner is the son of real estate developer Charles Kushner. He's principal owner of Kushner Companies, which he took over in 2008 when his father got nailed for tax evasion, illegal campaign donations, and witness tampering, spending a year in prison. These days, Kushner's firmly entrenched in the White House as Trump's senior advisor and is under federal and congressional investigation for meeting with a Russian banker with close ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin, while his father-in-law was transitioning into the role of president. Both men are Jewish, and Ivanka converted to Judaism before marrying her husband. Chelsea, who was raised Methodist, believes that she can raise her children in more than one faith. And speaking of touchy subjects, not talking politics. Ivanka explained that she and Chelsea support their parents but also respect each other, telling on the record, I think we have great respect for each other. Obviously, the intensity and the scrutiny of this moment in our lives is, is, is pretty extreme. Chelsea echoed Ivanka's sentiment, telling people, Friendship is always more important than politics. I learned that growing up, watching my parents be friends with people across the political spectrum in Arkansas. Chelsea even compared Ivanka to her father in Vogue, saying, She's always aware of everyone around her and ensuring that everyone is enjoying the moment. It's an awareness that in some ways reminds me of my dad and his ability to increase the joy of the room. Ivanka set the record straight regarding the lady's stance on the 2016 presidential election, saying, She's a good friend and um, we support each other. We're not the candidates. Or the children of the candidates. But that might not be the whole truth. Taking sides. In a 2016 CNN town hall with her family, Ivanka admitted she hadn't spoken to Chelsea recently, saying, The last 10 months have, um, have really been a whole different level. The presidential campaign was long and tough on the friends, with Trump dredging up former President Bill Clinton's sex scandals and Hillary calling Trump a bigot and a bully. A source told the New York Post, they basically have to put their friendship on pause because their parents are ripping each other to shreds. The hard part is that Chelsea and Ivanka were friends. Despite calling a truce during the election, Chelsea spoke out at a Glamour Facebook Live event, challenging Trump on how he'd fight for equal pay and accessible childcare. She said, It's not something he's spoken about. There are no policies on any of those um, fronts that you just mentioned on his website. As far as Chelsea's concerned, friends don't let friends' dads make crap promises. Respect Ivanka and Chelsea have always spoken very highly of each other on social media, and to the media itself, before, during, and after the election. Ivanka even retweeted Chelsea in 2015, adding her response, Well said, Chelsea Clinton. When Chelsea appeared on The View in September 2016, she spoke about Ivanka and their friendship, saying, we were friends long before this election. Our friendship uh, didn't start in politics. It certainly is not going to end because of politics. But all friendships have their challenges. BFFs forever. Despite the outcome of the election, Chelsea defended Ivanka's youngest half-sibling, Barron. She tweeted, Baron Trump deserves the chance every child does to be a kid, a response to the bullying that the youngest Trump received post-inauguration. But Chelsea did also add, standing up for every kid also means opposing POTUS politics that hurt kids. As rocky as things seem to be post-election, Ivanka seems to be intent on re-establishing bestie status, which she admitted to ABC News' Deborah Roberts. I haven't spoken about the specific challenges about this, this next chapter with her just yet, but, um, but I intend to. Maybe a play date for their kids could be just the ticket to rekindling their friendship? Chelvanka, never give up.